So here we have the second Crystalline Entity episode after Data Lore. I wouldn't... I mean, I'd, I'd forgive you if you forgot that it was in Data Lore since it was kind of the B-plot to the plot of, you know, lore. <laughs> Which is always weird when I talk about him. But anyways, I just want to mention something real quick here. So, the episode begins. We see some light flirting between Riker and What's-Her-Face. Uh, Carmen, played by Susan Diol who I kept looking at like, God, she looks so familiar. She actually plays Dinara, uh, Dinara Pell, over in Voyager. The, oh my God, I can't think of the name of the species all of a sudden. The Oregon Harvest People. I can't think of their names. Uh, she was actually a extremely minorly recurring character. I think she came back like twice total over there. Anywho, <clears throat> so the terror of the attack is actually quite well done. It's just moving on, and it's this horrible... You can hear it from a distance, and the sky goes dark. And it just starts... <laughs> tractoring up all of the life down to a molecular level. They actually did some really good practical effects with this, with the, the, the sand, which is basically just a sheet with sand on it, which they would then use and, and demonstrate the idea, of the, th the idea that every ounce of life, even down to the molecular level, had been ripped out of the terrain, while leaving the rest of the grass intact. And there's a nice bit where it would cut back to the Enterprise, and they're like, we're, we're receiving a weird thing. All right, increase speed to warp 8. Later on, Riker tries to communicate with them. Now this is, I'm sorry, I have to point this out. Riker tries to use his comm badge to communicate with the Enterprise, which at warp 9 is 6 hours away. That's an insanely large distance. 6 hours at warp 9? The only thing I could think is maybe they actually had like a relay in orbit or something, and that's what they were using to, you know, to try and communicate. Because otherwise, that doesn't even make a lick of sense. But whatever. This is the official Rick Berman era of Star Trek, where continuity doesn't quite make sense. Funny fact, actually, there was a re resistance to making this episode in general, and quite a few people who actually were involved in making it didn't like it, which is strange because I actually rather enjoyed this episode quite a bit, not just because of continuity, but because, well, actually, a lot of it is on the strength of Ellen Gear, the woman who plays Dr. Marr. She, I'll, I'll praise her in a bit, but I think she does an excellent job of her role. And I think they do a reasonably good job of portraying the crystalline entity, kind of how it always should have been portrayed. In fact, if we're being honest, the events of Data Lore actually make less sense keeping this episode in mind. So if we eject Data Lore, and I mean, it's Season 1 TNG. I've said before my willingness to eject anything from Season 1 if it doesn't conclude, or excuse me, co cohese with later continuity. So I'm willing to do that. But as I've said before, there's actually a lot of issues with the timing of what exactly happened back on the Omicron colony. But whatever, point being, point being, Rick Berman had, had given a decree from on high. I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. I think it was Rick Berman. I don't know for certainty. Someone on the production staff, someone in the, the executive offices, had said, no sequels when it comes to Season 5. Now, this is actually really funny if you're aware of the episodes in Season 5, but that was the, the call from on high, no sequels. And yet, several people felt, including Jerry Taylor, who did some of the writing for this episode, and does an excellent job with Dr. Uh, Dr. Mara, I might add, and... Um, Michael Pillar felt like this was something that was a unique take on the crystalline entity and something that worked. And so they went ahead and gave the go-ahead, even though they normally wouldn't have. And I'm happy they did. But like I mentioned, there's this bit where they're like increased war paid, increased war nine, we gotta get there right now. And there's some really genuine tension as they're in this cave and it's shaking and people have just died horribly. It's okay, they didn't die horribly, that's not true. They died like that. I doubt they felt anything. Really, I don't. I doubt there was anything left for them to be felt by. Then I realized something. I did a little bit of an experiment. I rewinded the episode, muted it, watched the scenes again, and they were still just as tense. All of the tension is from the, the gestures and the... the articulations of the actors and the visual presentation, which is excellent. But the reason, you might be like, Lord, why are you bringing that up? Because the music's generic and boring. This right here, I know I've, I know I've talked about the music so many times, so please forgive me for bringing it up once again. But I bring it up here because this episode, the detention and horror of the first few scenes of this episode succeed in spite of the music, not because of it. 
I barely noticed the music my first time watching. I was actually in the middle of scratching down genuine tension, and then that made me think, huh. And I was listening to it, because I had the headphones on at the time. I was like, and I could just barely hear in the background this, 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 da, 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 you know, completely generic tension music that sounded like anything on old Voyager when they're being attacked by the Kazon for five seconds. You know, that, that, you know the theme, you know the generic tension theme, you know exactly what I'm talking about if you've watched Star Trek from this point onwards. Um, and so I went back through a third time and fired up in, at the, oh, okay, I fired up YouTube and I fired up several scenes from Booby Trap and Best of Both Worlds and just kind of had them playing in the background while I watched the scene. I, I don't feel, feel like I need to explain the results of this test for me and once again why I reiterate this music thing. Anyways, so we bring in Dr. Marr, who is an expert on the crystal energy and its attacks. That's terrifying. The fact that there have been a sufficient number of attacks for there to be an expert on the Federation on dealing with this kind of a thing is horrifying in its own right. She flat out says 11 recorded attacks since season one. So in the last four or so years, three or so years, I guess, you know, there's been about there's been 11 known attacks in Federation territory. That's terrifying. She is also... So she objects to being with Data, and you know because she relates him to Lore. And then this is part of why I give her such praise, and I'll be giving her more praise in the future. If you tell an actor, let me rephrase this, if you tell a generic actor or a decent actor, not a great actor, I want you to act upset at someone. I want you to act like you can't stand being to this person. They will overpresent that. I'll try to demonstrate, you know. Don't worry, Dr. Data, that's not what she says, but, you know, Data, I will let you know if there's anything I feel needs to be said in this matter. You know, just really throwing it out there. Instead, she's very understated, very subtle. Even when she accuses him flat out, to his face, she says, I'm just trying, I'm trying to, I'm accusing you with collaborating with this creature. Doesn't that bother you? And there's just a little bit of reality to the way she presents it. She does an excellent job. I've said so many times that Star Trek lives and breathes on its guest stars, and this is a great example. She elevates this episode by herself, in my opinion, with the subtlety and nuance of her acting. I'll be bringing that up later, too, but I'll get to that in a minute. So she she's very harsh, but at the same time, the double act between Spiner and uh, Miss Ellen here... Ellen Gear is, is actually so excellent because the dynamic shifts over time. At first, she sees him as exactly the same problem as Laura. She has effectively decided to fixate the blame for the death of her son onto Data. Over time, that kind of shifts from being that to being her working with him to her developing a genuine respect for him then to her latching on to him over time as she realizes he has the literal memories and, and journals and logs of her son. And then, well, we'll talk about the last point when we get there, because that's when it gets a little bit debatable. I do like how there's a great bit at which she realizes she can't hurt him. She just stops at that point. Don't you understand? I'm, I, I, it doesn't, there's nothing I could say that can hurt you, is there? No, doctor. And so she just immediately abandons it. That's telling right there. That is the strength of Jerry Taylor when she really is at her best, because what we are showing there in the script, in addition to in the presentation, is she has now realized that there's no point in hurting him, so she stops talking to him about it. In other words, all she ever wanted was to hurt him. It was literally just a, you are a substitute for all of my anger at this thing. And I, you are, it, it, I've talked about this so many times. You can't hurt a nation. You can't hurt a monster. You can't hurt a crystalline entity. But you can hurt a person. And so people have a tendency to fixate most of their blame or hatred or vengeance or whatever on an individual because you can do something to that individual, but you can't hurt a nation, right? Or a people or a concept or whatever. And so she does this to him, and it just bounces right off. At which point she, intelligent scientist, just kind of stops. and is like, okay, fine, whatever. So there's several scenes where they just kind of tech their way through the, the situation as they're trying to find this thing. And a B-plot kind of starts to happen in the background, where Picard mentions the desire to contact this thing. I had a whole speech prepared before I even watched the episode. And as I was watching it, I realized... 
Data Laura contradicts that. Damn it. Because I had a great speech to give you guys. I'm still actually going to give it to you because it still might apply. But Data Laura really does contradict this. Hear me out for a second. I want you to imagine for a moment that you kill ants. I know, right? I mean, I've killed thousands, if not more, ants in my life because I hate ants. They're, they're terrible, disgusting things, and they have no place in my house, so they die the moment I see them. I've also gotten very good at killing insects in general, having you know, several family members and friends who have worked as uh, pest control in the past. So, you know, I've, I have paid attention and I have listened to the lessons on how to get those things the hell out of your house. What would happen if ants started to communicate with you? Like if an ant was able to somehow say, please don't kill me. What if all of a sudden you realized, and of course, obviously this is a totally made up thing, but hear me out. What if you suddenly realized ants were sentient and sapient and you were exterminating people rather than just bugs? Now, I imagine I'm going to get some mixed responses to this. I do want your actual response. I would love to hear your actual response, but to me, that would horrify me. That would be just... Oh my god. I've talked about this concept a few times before. This came up in Voyager, uh, the episode Memorial. How much it impacted uh, Harry, especially, but also Paris, the idea of doing these horrible, terrifying acts because, because they're horrible, terrifying acts. Because it would really bother them to do things that they would consider so repugnant to murder, especially in, in fear and anger like that. It would bother me in the same general manner. The very idea of, I've never killed anyone. God willing, I never will. Because that's just horrible. Death is not a good thing. It can be an acceptable thing under the right circumstances, but a good thing? So the idea that the thousands of lives I've extinguished were actual ex, you know, lives that mattered, for lack of a better way to put it, you know, sentient, sapient lives, that would just stop me in my tracks. And that brings me to this, the B plot of the episode, the attempt to communicate with the crystalline entity. Now, we will never know, because they kill the sucker, spoiler alert. But there's a lot that can be said about wh how the crystalline entity would have reacted upon the realization that, the, that the, the, the food it was consuming was capable of intelligent communication, that it was something that was of a like intelligence to the crystalline entity itself. I like, that's why I used the ant parallel, as weird as that may sound, because I wanted to put you in the shoes of the entity. And that's why I, I actually really was paying attention this time around, because Picard is really careful on his dialogue. Excellent crafted dialogue. At all points, he makes it clear, I'm willing to kill the hell out of this thing if I have to. Because if this is just a monster, or if this is something that can't be reasoned with, or if this is something we can't find some kind of co common ground on, then it needs to die. It has killed many, many people, way more than we even know about, right? But he wants to try, because it may work, because this might work, because we could possibly make this happen. At every step of the line, he wants to reach out to this, even knowing the pragmatic truth. They even show the pragmatism versus the idealism. Because, obviously, Picard is the idealist here, but Riker comes in and he is the pragmatist. Sir, maybe we should just kill it the moment we see it. And Picard says, I think there's some vengeance talking there. And Riker slaps him down hard. I like that scene, by the way, because that is exactly the correct reaction. Riker says, I'm sorry, sir. I'm not a green cadet. I have lost people before. This has nothing to do with vengeance. And he doesn't say this. He doesn't say it. But what he says is, this is not vengeance. This is pragmatism. We may not get a chance to stop this thing again. And we should use it to stop it to ensure that none of this ever happens again. This is cold calculus. The end. And it's very easy to see the frankly military side of things that Riker is presenting there. Indeed, to be 100% blunt, as weird as this may sound, I don't even particularly feel bad that the crystallinity was destroyed in this episode. Why? Because it was all a chance. It was all a maybe. We will never know the truth of what that might have been. The, the crystal entity is explored in a couple of uh, ancillary works that continue on in the extended canon. It's even brought up in Star Trek Online, although we don't get a lot of lore there for it. It's just a raid boss, but we don't know. We don't know, for example, what if the ants reached out to you and said, please stop killing us. Let's make some way of, you know, both of us being able to coexist. And the person said, no. 
What if the entity said no? What if the entity said I don't care? What if the entity said, huh, that's fascinating, and kept killing anyways, or didn't recognize something that could communicate with it as something that mattered? There's too many variables there. The one and only thing we do absolutely know is that this is a Cthulhu-esque terror. This is a Lovecraftian nightmare, really, because it is something we don't understand that doesn't seem to acknowledge or care about us, that is beyond our scope, and is absolutely devastating to us simply by being there in addition to the fact that we are casual food for it. And, I, and that's why I specifically call this Lovecraftian because it's, Lovecraftian isn't just about tentacles. Lovecraftian is about the, the, the beyondness, so above and beyond humans that it's just wah, right? That's the most technical description I've ever given. I hope you remember that one. Because this thing is a nightmare. It truly is. I've already complained about it back in Data Lore, so I'm not going to reiterate my point there. They do some better stuff with it here and establishing it more as an actual thing. Even though there's so many questions left unsaid about this thing. Was this the only one? Where did it come from? How did it build? How old is it? I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff here that is never explained. Now, that B plot is excellent, but the A plot is perfection. As I've already said, you know, Brent Spiner does an excellent data, and Ellen Greer does an excellent Dr. Marr. Her slowly shifting mentality really shows how much this is impacting her on a personal level. How much she is still thinking about this. It, she, she almost divests herself. There's a great scene where she is actively working and talking about working and then talking about her son and then talking about working and then talking about her son, and she just bounces back between the, the two smoothly like any other person who has effectively disconnected herself. And here's the thing. I like to metaphor things as circuits. That's how it usually works in my mind. Um, and thus a completed circuit, a closed circuit, is something that is done and concluded, right? But for this, I want to use a slightly different analogy, a door. I want you to picture that any, that, that your mind, your heart, your emotions, whatever you want to call it, is a house. And every open door is something that is yet unresolved in your life, okay? And all sorts of bad stuff can happen from those doors just being wide open and banging in the wind. Her son died decades ago. I forget the exact number. It's like 26 years, I want to say. That's off the top of my head. I could be wrong about that. It's been a while. That door has been open and banging in the wind on its rusted hinges with rot and decay all over it for decades, and you can tell. She acts like she's gotten over it, like she's accepted it. But the truth is, as so many other people do, all she's done is bury herself in her work. And again, wonderful praise to the actress. She gets this across, how much she is... Because when she starts to examine those feelings again, those emotions, it's raw. And it's on the surface. It's right there. Just barely contained by her professional veneer. And the further into the episode, the worse it gets. She effectively loses herself to it at the end. But again, I'll talk about that in a minute. And so we see that this issue was never closed. This circuit was never completed for her. And being able to hear about her son from Data is overwhelming. There are several wonderful scenes where the director chose to have a close-up. I'm sorry, hang on one second. Who was the director? Uh, that was Cliff Bull. That doesn't surprise me. Bull goes out of his way to try and drag the attention of the camera onto her, and specifically her face, even when other stuff's going on. That's actually technically the focus of the events, because what we want to see is her reaction to them. And there's this bit where he starts reciting the journal in the son's voice, and she starts almost crying. That scene is brilliant. I know I've actually pointed this out before, but it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, and I admittedly, I basically inherited this pet peeve from an old director of mine back when I was in high school and post-high school doing theater stuff. Um, Goheen, that was his name. Uh, I don't remember his first name, but I remember his last name was Goheen. He, um, he was talking about doing sadness, tears, and crying on camera. Now, in a theater... 
you have to make it loud and demonstrable. But in real life, people don't do that. People don't do... And yet, how many times have you seen in a movie or a show when someone is stricken with grief, they just go... And they're very loud and they're very obnoxious about it, right? Now, I'm not saying that's always the wrong choice, but it's clear that that's kind of the go-to for most actors in portraying grief. But I've always found that the really good actors know how to portray grief much quieter. I've given praise to Ian McKellen on this exact point before, but here I give praise to Ellen Greer because the way she does it, the way she just, you could just see her face and her emotions as she just starts to dissolve at hearing about all that her son had gone through and the fact that, oh God, I'm actually making myself tear up here a little bit. Please forgive me. But I can just put myself in that moment. I can feel what she feels because of how well she expresses it. It's brilliant acting and it should be recognized. So, they hear the attack. They hear the attack. Um, she listens as, as that happens. She starts talking about her son. You know, she, she reaches out to Data. They connect more and more and more. They get to the end. They finally take a chance. They communicate with the thing successfully. I'm going to stop here for just a second. What do you think about the entity? Not just in general, but about up here. Do you think it's sentient and sapient? Do you think it's capable of communicating? Do you think it's inherently positive on the moral moralistic scale? Do you think it cares about killing other things? Do you think they could have made an accord? Where they, Because, I mean, they could have provided it food in some other way, right? I mean, you can't tell me that wasn't a possibility. What do you think? Because we'll never know. They start to communicate with it, and she kills it. Now, this is a powerful and awesome moment that is absolutely ruined by the fact that it makes no sense. I'm sorry, I cannot buy for even a second that this woman was able to successfully make this happen, and no one was able to stop her. That Data and Jordy are just incapable of bypassing whatever the hell she's done for quite some time. It takes like 30 to 40 seconds for this to finally kill this thing. So they had tons of time to do something about this. They could also just shut off the emitters, just... Pull the power cord. They could have also moved the ship as another possibility. But they don't do anything. They just stand there letter. That's That's the weakest moment of the episode, in my opinion, right there. It's just, come on, guys. But she kills it. And you know what's funny? The way she says it, she told her today, I did it for you. She says it so quietly, I did it for you. I have an honest question for you guys, really. I, I just said earlier that I hope I never kill, and yet if this thing had killed my niece or my mom or any other member of my close family, I would have killed it on sight. Not out of vengeance, really, because I don't understand that emotion, but because I now understand through deep personal experience exactly the threat that this thing poses. Because... Whether or not it is possible to communicate with this thing is a variable, an unknown. But what is known is the devastation it has already caused. The many, many people who now have to write letters like Riker does, or receive them, because those lives were permanently snuffed out by something that probably didn't even notice they were there. I am sorry, but from Riker's perspective, I, I kind of agree with Riker's perspective on this one. The cold calculus of the moment kind of applied here. Not because cold calculus applies always, but rather because of the severity. Because this is not just one little thing that might kill a person, or two, or three, or five. This is something that consumes colonies, planets, ships. And that's a level of threat that has to be dealt with at the highest scale of possibility. Now, I could be wrong about that, and I know that. I acknowledge that. But you could probably understand being in that woman's shoes, can't you? Jerry Taylor, who wrote this, who was a mother when she wrote this, pretty much put herself into Dr. Mars' shoes when writing those scenes. And that leads us to the debatable part. Why did she do it? Did she do it because of cold calculus? Did she do it because it was the right thing to do? Did she do it out of vengeance? Did she do it for her son so he could finally rest at peace? Did she do it, and this is the one I'm mentioning last because this is my personal theory, did she do it because she basically lost it? I know that's kind of a common thing in fiction, but in all total sincerity, when I say lost it, I mean 
That wide open door that had been left open and banging in the wind was a very sore wound for her, and it was freshly prodded by the events of this episode. I think she basically lost the ability to properly cope with the emotions she was feeling, and in the process, did the only thing that made any sense to her. To conclude this incident, close the door, and complete the circuit by destroying the entity. And I say that, obviously I say that so rationally and soundly, but what I mean is that she effectively irrationally reached this point of, of conclusion. I don't know. That's why I asked you, what do you guys think? I really like this episode. I, I actually forgot how much I like this episode. I hope you've enjoyed my thoughts. I'll see you next time, guys. Cool.